According to the results of a Yale climate study, 28% of Americans do not believe with certainty that climate change is real, and 35% are not worried about climate change. These public opinion numbers are extremely concerning. There is a large body of evidence supporting the fact that climate change is occurring. So where is the gap? Why don't people care? Maybe it's because 55% of those surveyed had not personally experienced the effects of climate change. So who is getting hit the hardest by environmental issues, and why are adverse environmental effects felt disproportionately? To begin examining these questions, we must start by establishing a working definition of environmental justice. Environmental justice is an objective, a goal to be sought, that is distributive and procedural in practice and has to do with valuing people and natural resources as the ultimate goal. We will work with the EPA's definition. Environmental justice is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies so that everyone has access to a healthy environment in which to live, learn, and work. Environmental injustice is when these goals are not achieved, and unfortunately low-income minority communities feel the adverse consequences of environmental injustice disproportionately more than other Americans. People in these communities suffer health and quality of life consequences every day as a result. The effects of environmental injustice are intensely present just an hour south of the University of Alabama in the region known as the Black Belt. Alabama's Black Belt, named for its rich topsoil, is the perfect environment for growing cotton and other crops. This area has a dark history of slavery and exploitation, and the population living in this area is very low income as the result of systemic racism. Below the rich surface soil is a layer of vertisol clays, which shrink and swell based on moisture content. These clays make percolation, which is water infiltrating through the ground, nearly impossible when they are swollen. The result is a region with historical and environmental conditions against it that is plagued by wastewater mismanagement issues. Because the population is rural and low income, a typical municipal wastewater treatment system is simply not feasible. Septic systems are extremely expensive and often fail because they rely on percolation, which fails due to the clay soils. The current collection system has leaks, it malfunctions regularly, and local residents often complain of odors, sewage leaks, and high water bills for a system that doesn't work. As a result, most families utilize straight pipe systems, meaning they discharge raw sewage directly from their homes. This sewage runs off into local waterways and can make people very sick. Philip Alston, the UN Special Reporter on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, visited counties in the Black Belt of Alabama in 2017 and called these conditions a violation of human rights. During my time at UA, I have been exposed to environmental injustice issues through service, classes, and interdisciplinary curriculum. I lead field research collecting E. coli and cryptosporidium samples from waterways in the Black Belt to quantify just how immense of a problem the wastewater issues are. I interviewed my research advisor, Dr. Mark Elliott, to get his take on environmental injustice issues. Basically, in the Black Belt region of Alabama, we have the confluence of a lot of rural poverty with some of the worst soil conditions for on-site wastewater treatment technologies. Uh, uh, seen anywhere in the world. Over the last few years, we've been trying to characterize the nature and scope of the problem and the impacts on water quality, the potential impacts on, on health associated with uh, these pathogens getting, these fecal pathogens getting into the surface water. And now we're transitioning to uh, developing, identifying, designing um, solutions, technical solutions for these problems. So that would be both in collection of the wastewater and then treatment of the wastewater. It should not be a surprise to anyone that African-American communities in Alabama were largely left out of those subsidies and the subsidies were captured mostly by wealthier communities that were mostly white. There's going to be across um, the next five to six years 
uh, on the order of probably about a billion dollars in Alabama for drinking water and wastewater projects for infrastructure. It's gonna cover uh, the capital cost for installation. We're trying to, um, in parallel with the federal funding for the for the capital costs, to get private funding for the um, for the ongoing O and M costs. Now, with the bipartisan infrastructure law and the American Rescue Plan Act, there's an opportunity, like a generational opportunity, to address this injustice that has happened with these small communities, and to actually subsidize fed, with federal money the infrastructure in the same way that all of us who live in cities and towns had our infrastructure subsidized. Uh, through the middle of the 20th century. So we're really hopeful and um, the Alabama Department of Environmental Management, ADEM, who will be administering this funding, is really committed to you taking advantage of this opportunity to address uh, these injustices that happened in the past and in the allocation of this federal money. So we're really hopeful that by the time this money is spent, uh, that we will have a solution for um, all you know, hopefully 100% of these communities um, uh, through this through this opportunity that we have to use this federal infrastructure money. For these low-income communities, they they will not pay anything for the infrastructure itself. Learning about water issues in the Black Belt and beyond has been a huge part of my educational journey at UA. As you heard, our research in this entire project is interdisciplinary. It's scientific, but also relies on economics, history, legislation, and communication between many stakeholders. It's not just those in academia, though. So much of the progress in the Black Belt should be credited to the grassroots movements, like Black Belt citizens fighting for health and justice, the people who live in the Black Belt and advocate constantly for change. They have participated in multiple documentaries, interviews, and local movements emphasizing their right to experience environmental justice just like their fellow American citizens. It takes an army to confront injustice, and you can't come at complex issues like those in the Black Belt from just one angle. Time and effort collaborating between and using strategies from many disciplines is critical to addressing issues of injustice. Of course, there's still much to be done, but as more people have learned about the issues in the Black Belt and become passionate about getting these communities the resources they deserve, these issues have finally made their way into the public eye and politics and are starting to progress. With the funding Dr. Elliott discussed, there's a real chance for change, showing the potential transformative power of interdisciplinary education. Thank you for watching.